make Hurry, Mr. Bergeron's on Don't forget the popcorn, Frank Coming, dear I'd like to introduce Laura Stewart, who's the program coordinator for the Salt Marsh Senior Center. Laura. Excellent. Thank you. You're Thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming back on this beautiful day. We're standing together, by the way, because this is the Can two mics. In order for you to hear this, <laughs> I've got to be next to her with this mic. Because we are recording so this going like for this. NTV 18. So at some point, this will be on. You need to move on. Yeah, see? Can there you, you go. There. Can you hear me now? How's that? Okay. So we're recording over here for NCTV 18. And can everybody hear me in the back? Excellent. If anybody gets hot or cold, just let me know. We have the fans on. Doors and windows are open. Uh, we do have some fire exits. There's a door in the back. And these two doors going out will get you outside. So thank you all for coming again to listen to Arthur and who he's invited over here. He'll introduce them later. Um, everybody has a gazette from the Salt Marsh. If you do not get it mailed to you or would like to change it to be emailed to you, let me know afterwards and I can fix that for you. And let me introduce Arthur Bergeron from Merrick O'Connell. Thank you very much and thank you thank for the wonderful introduction. And one of the reasons I wanted, we, we asked to have both folks one to get, once again up on the screen, up, on, up here is because we are taping this and one of the goals of this exercise is for all of the people who don't come to the Council on Aging to make folks aware of kind of what is here. It's really to connect so that folks who may have never come can kind of be connecting names and faces and stuff. And so I really, really appreciate it. Uh, now once again, we're playing this with this kind of double mic game here, which is why we may be looking funny. You know, it's because we, uh, the person who is speaking needs to have this mic so that you can hear them. And it's to be close to me with my Thai mic so that the camera can hear them. So that's how this is all going to work. So um, thank you very, very much all for coming. Um, thank you for, to Laura. Thank you to Ella Finn for coming back from the Visiting Nurses Association. Thank you to Alice Daniels who provides home care here and she's going to talk to you about her agency and about home care in general in the context of this topic, which is planning to stay home. Next slide. But it's also planning to stay home when something bad has happened. Uh, and by the way, people who have been speaking to me today have been kind enough to not notice the kind of the little scar that's running on my face, speaking of which. Uh, and so they asked me, what is this? Well, I, you know, you know, you've all gone through this, right? So the short answer is a desk fell on my head. Uh, the long answer is too complicated. So that, that's, that, you know, it just happens. So the question, so once again, we're talking about Frank and Mary. Now we realize, and so Frank has a house, Frank and Mary have a house. Uh, they obviously don't live on Nantucket because it's only worth $400,000. Uh, he has an IRA that's worth $150,000. They have joint, a joint annuity of $100,000. They have a bank account worth $75,000. Their total assets are $725,000. Frank is living on Social Security at $1,000 a month. Mary's Social Security is $600,000. It's more than half of Frank's because she also worked, while she was, um, worked when she was younger, so she's got a higher benefit. They are going to be okay. They can pay all of their bills uh, and get along as long as nothing <laughs> terrible happens, typically in, as long as nothing terrible happens medically. And, and, and once again, last time we talked about Frank and Mary as they're just retiring and they're just trying to figure out what all of the benefits are and what all of the, the programs are that they can avail themselves of here in Nantucket so that if something is ba bad happens and they're in emergency mode, they can figure it out easily. So in this case, what happens if Frank falls down, can't get up, he's heading to Nantucket Hospital? Next slide. Um, so what should he be thinking about in that case? Uh, and by the way, we're going to be trying to cover a lot of material here where we're talking about kind of things that you should be thinking about. We can't, we're not trying to provide you with all of the answers, but we are trying to provide you with all the questions. Because a lot of these questions are questions that you should be thinking about before you fall down and you have to go to the hospital because this is just the kind of stuff that happens, right? So one question if you're at the hospital is how long can you stay? And we're going to talk about that quite a bit. Uh, are you getting better? Are you getting better while you're at the hospital? Can you go home? Uh, and who pays? Does Medicare pay? Does Mass Health pay? Uh, are you paying? What about the drug? What about your drugs 
and what is your discharge plan? So I just want to stay, you know, start with the, the drugs question. One of the things that you really need to understand when you get to the hospital uh, is that all of the drugs that you're taking, if you're taking any, does anybody here take any, any drugs at all? <laughs> oh, maybe, okay, um, two, I saw two. Um, all of the drugs that you're taking, you can't take them when you're at the hospital, right? Because you've got prescriptions for them while you're at home, but when you get to the hospital, you're in this other world. Um, and only, and the drugs from the hospital, only the, the hospital's pharmacy is going to produce your drugs and, the, and they're going to be prescribed by the doctor at the hospital. So one of the questions that, the, that they're going to be asking you when you're in the ER is what drugs are you taking, right? And did you take them today, right? Because they need to figure out not only what you should be taking, what Frank should be taking because of what just happened and now he's at the, in the hospital, but also whether those new things are going to have any bad effects on the things that you just brought with you, right? So now what is the answer to that? Well, one thing is your primary care physician uh, needs to have a list of your drugs. You, ideally, you need to have a list of your drugs yourself and of what you are taking. I know many people do keep those in something called a file of life, uh, just a form that is just a file that has a bunch of really useful information that's one of the things, and you have to keep that thing updated just so that when they're asking, because probably when they're asking that question of Frank, he's not in a good mood. He's not kind of remembering some of this stuff because he just fell. That's why he's at the, he's at the hospital. So you need to figure out that piece. Um, how long can you stay at the hospital? Well, you know, um, you can stay at the hospital for a long time as long as you're paying privately. Um, but if you think that your insurance company is going to pay when you're at the hospital, um, that's going to be a very limited stay. So this is the question when you're at the hospital. We're going to step back to the old slides. Admission versus observation. Um, when you get to the hospital and you're in bad shape, and even if you're staying at the hospital, even maybe overnight, you may not have been admitted yet to the hospital. Uh, and you want to be talking to the hospital about whether that is the case. The reason for this is there has been this major pushback, or not pushback, push, by Medicare as part of their attempt at cost containment to keep hospitals from admitting patients. Because when you get to the hospital, the way that the hospital figures out how much it's getting paid and how much Medicare is going to pay them or whatever your supplementary insurance is, but I bet you, if you're on Medicare, if you're over 65, is there anybody here over 65? <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so it, it, the way Medicare is going to figure that, the way they're going to figure this out is if you are in the hospital staying overnight and you've been admitted, um, then the price that they're paying for your admission is one price. If you're there simply on observation, that is, they've decided, Medicare has decided that, that you, you don't seem to be sick enough to get admitted, but you really ought to be staying at the hospital overnight. The price they're paying is about 20% of what your, the, the price is at, at admission, which is the reason why you may be bumping into and you may have heard of cases where people have gone to the hospital and they didn't get admitted. The reason why I mention that is that this is really a place where or a role that, the, that visiting nurses, that a geriatric care manager, that somebody can be playing in terms of trying to advocate for you at the hospital to get you admitted. Um, and the reason for that is going to come, become more significant when we get to the rehab slide. But so how long are you going to stay? Um, can you go home? And you'll, obviously you'll be talking to your doctors about that. And what is the discharge plan? Now, the reason why I mention this discharge plan is that if the hospital say, because one other thing about kind of hospital financing, this is not to dump on hospitals, but you need to understand when you get to the hospital, and many of you probably know this, the amount that the hospital gets paid um, for your stay at the hospital does not depend on the number of days that you're at the hospital. Does everybody know that, right? No, it, it depends on what the code is for the thing that you went to the hospital with. There are these giant code books uh, that are actually, you know, they were developed by Medicare, but many of the, of the insurance in co companies now use the same codes, right? And depending on what your code is, that is the amount that the Medicare will pay for your stay at the hospital, no matter how long you stay, no matter how long you stay. So you can see from the hospital's perspective, once you've been admitted and your code is X and they're going to pay 
$8,000 for X to the hospital, whether you stay for one day or four days. So from the hospital's perspective, how many days do they want you to stay? Right. So you, so you need to kind of understand that. Now, one of the reasons why that's of significance is um, discharge planning. From the day that you get to the hospital, the hospital is trying to figure out how to discharge you. Right? Because they don't want you to be there for a long time. So they're kind of working on that. And you, know, you may get discharged to home if you're healthy enough to do that. You may get discharged to another facility. But they're trying to figure it out. So, and, but because you're over 65, um, they can't just tell you they're discharging you and kind of wheel you out. They actually have to give you a notice. They're required to give you a notice under, under federal law. They're required to give you a notice saying that you're being discharged and here's your discharge plan and you have the right to appeal that notice. To appeal that notice. There is actually an administrative appeal entity in Massachusetts, right, to which um, this matter will get referred for a third party, re an independent review, if you decide to appeal your stay at the hospital. So it's something that you just, you want to be aware of. Now, who do you want to help you with that appeal? Not your lawyer. Right? We don't get this stuff. I can't pronounce half of the stuff you know, that they do at hospitals. You really want, you want to be dealing with nurses, you want to be dealing with a geriatric care manager, you, would, you want to have somebody that you trust and your doctor that advocating for you as to how long you should be staying at the hospital. Next slide. 